slide. So it's really with great pleasure that I introduce um, Dr. Chris McIntyre, who's a professor of medicine, medical biophysics and pediatrics and the Robert Lindsay Chair of Dialysis Research and Innovation. Um, Chris is, is, hails from the UK and attended Charing Cross and Westminster Medical School in London and has specialized in nephrology initially as a registrar at UCL, University College London, and subsequently at St. Mark's in the Royal London Hospital. He was a professor of nephrology at Nottingham University in the UK and head of the Division of Graduate Entry Medicine and Medical Services before he came to Canada in 2014 and now is in London, uh, Ontario, where he's, as I said, the professor of medicine, pediatrics and medical biophysics. There is an inaugural holder, the Robert Lindsay Chair of Dialysis Research, which is his, uh, and he really um, has been very creative and innovative in his approach to understanding um, what dialysis does to our patients, uh, and especially what it does to um, cardiovascular brain, gastrointestinal structure and function. Um, he's a, a, an amazing mentor with a fantastic sense of humor, uh, as well as being creative and innovative. So with that, uh, Dr. McIntyre, I'll pass it over to you with your very provocative title, and uh, off we go. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Adair. I, I, I appreciate the introduction hugely. It's nice to hear at least somebody say something nice about you, um, as in, uh, about me. So it's a real pleasure to be talking to you um, and it's been a pleasure and a privilege to be able to talk about this kind of stuff over a number of years now um yes, let me use that off the screen um and i was challenged a little bit for this talk to actually try and change things up from the way that i often do things before and i, I realized that when i've spoken on this subject the idea that it's actually dialysis artifactually that's generating many of the harms that we call uremic i've often had the very similar pathway you know i'd go through a series of slides where i take the viewers gently by the hand and show you all the various horrors in the uh, in the torture chamber and then lead you gently to the concept that um, dialysis is bad so this time we've changed it up slightly um we're just going to go straight for it uh we're terrible at dialysis and we need to do something about it and dialysis is terrible it's a catastrophe wrapped in a disaster thrown in a dumpster fire this is true both when we look at it, and it's true, most importantly, when we ask our patients. This is a quote from a patient of mine in the UK, who at the time was a 26-year-old woman who had just about the day after I saw this, had a cardiac arrest and survived it, thankfully, in the car park outside the dialysis unit. I know I need dialysis, but how can anything that makes me feel so awful not be bad for me? So... For this morning, I want us to start, hopefully, from the shared acceptance that dialysis is bad. And it's objectively bad. I mean, if we want to benchmark it against things like cancer, these are survival curves for four or five of the most common cancers. And the green line on both is where dialysis sits. So you're better off being on dialysis than having pancreas cancer, but you're worse off than having breast and colorectal. If you decide to just look at diabetics on dialysis, the survival and quality of life is about the same as stage four lung cancer. And this is a treatment that we're spending five to 10% of most countries' healthcare budgets on. So I've challenged various people over the years about this, and I was in one particularly eminent institution in the UK, and I asked the chief nephrology there the question, what kind of dialysis machines do you use in your center? And the gentleman who was tasked with the owner's responsibility of providing life-saving treatments to several thousand patients replied without any irony, white ones. So that told me, unfortunately, he was unable to discriminate between a dialysis machine and a domestic refrigerator. And I think this is at the absolute heart of where we are at the moment. The enemy, the challenge is not actually dialysis itself, it's the terrible sense of learned helplessness that we have acquired over these last few decades. We have just accepted that if you're on dialysis, you will feel awful and you will do badly. And having made that acceptance, it's very easy to not do anything about it. Now, obviously, we all have to feel that we're active. So what we do is organizational VF. It's all activity, but no output. We're moving 
deck chairs around on the Titanic, like we're moving three cups and a ball. And then we're calling things we like to hope are significant, key performance indicators, and focusing on process rather than outcome. So really what I want to spend my time talking about is how do we move beyond the wall? How do we deal with this sense of learned helplessness? And I want to break it down into a number of domains. And I want to show you very specific examples of work that we're doing that's addressing those domains. I'm not suggesting what we're doing is the answer, but I want to be very specific in showing how these things can at least try to be tackled. So I want to think about that we need to treat the disease, the pathophysiology as it exists, and not how we hope it does, not how we want to port it from some other disease. We need to focus on the parts of the challenge that matter to patients, not the ones that matter to us. We need to be ruthless and focused on additional discovery, not pretending we know everything now. We've got to be innovative, and we have to be innovative in devices, uh, service design, therapy repurposing, and drugs. And we also have to be ruthless that if there's stuff that isn't working, stop doing it. Just because it's a habit doesn't justify carrying on doing it. With all of that, I want to talk about vibrant jungles rather than sterile monocultures. And then think about how do we actually assess impact of what we're doing? And then finish with the idea of complexity. So if you'll bear with me, that's what we're going to trundle through this morning. So the first thing, deal with the actual disease. For a long time, having recognized that cardiovascular disease was the main killer in dialysis patients, we focused on the idea that this was just an exaggeration of the processes that were killing people who were not on dialysis. Large vessel disease, thrombotic occlusion, atheroma, statins, VF, beta blockers, devices. What we didn't do was actually see what was really happening to our patients and then to look at our innovations in that rubric. So the first thing is we need to accept that the human body is one single contiguous endothelial surface. It invests every single vulnerable vascular bed and hemodialysis is a particularly severe circulatory stress stressor that affects all of those organs simultaneously and doesn't care if there's large vessel disease, it's predominantly causing microcirculatory injury and loss of perfusion. I can demonstrate this best by looking at it. This is, um, this is some images from, from, from my wet lab where we have a, um, a rat model of hemodialysis. We have a little teeny tiny dialysis machine that we built. We build our own dialyzers. We run pump speeds that are all uh, 0.5 mils a minute. Everything is, is, is rated down. We have blood coming out of the femoral artery and returning to the tail vein and the animals are monitored continuously. And in these experiments, what we've done is we have exposed skeletal muscle and we've put a microscope on it and we can see the flow of red blood cells through the microcirculation in real time as we dialyze the animal. So imagine this vascular bed is replicated in any one of those vulnerable systems. Here you see at rest, almost all of the field is nicely perfused with blood running through it. We then start to dialyze the animal. Well, all right, let's just go back. We then start to dialyze the animal for an hour, for two hours, and then and finally for three hours. And you can see that the proportion of that field that's being perfused goes down and down and the speed of the flow of those red blood cells goes down and down. So this is the unifying vascular reality of patients on an extracorporeal circuit. We can see that in humans. In this case, these are all studies that we did looking at the heart, measuring the flow of blood in the heart using PET, using MRI, using high resolution CT, and indeed then looking with echocardiography to see the bits of the heart that lose contractile function when they get ischemic. That's cardiac stunning. That's when it happens again and again, that drives fixed dysfunction, heart failure, and death. So what I showed you in the rat, we can demonstrate in any one of these organs within the human during live dialysis. This um, 
entity of diastasis-induced ischemic injury is heavily driven by how fast the fluid comes off and how low the blood pressure goes, the hallmark circulatory stress. Um, there's no threshold. There's no safe ultrafiltration rate. This is MRI work looking at how many bits of the heart got starved of blood against how fast the fluid came off. More is worse, less is better. And this is echo work looking at a year later with the light bars being the bits of the heart that were starved of blood on dialysis and a year later have lost half the contractile function versus the bits of the heart that didn't stun on dialysis a year later are exactly the same. Now, those people suffering this injury, those are the people who die. The top line are the third of the patients who didn't stun. Nobody died. Everybody who dies is within the group who were suffering dialysis-induced injury. So this is the battlefield. This is where we need to look at our interventions. It doesn't matter if you're not uremic. This happens in AKI with both continuous and intermittent therapy. And unfortunately, it even happens in children who don't have any atheroma, don't have diabetes. This study, our youngest patient was two, the average age was seven, and all of the children stunned on dialysis. This is small vessel disease. So taking the fight to where it's actually happening. The second bit, what matters to patients? Now, of course, patients worry about dying. And that is largely going to be cardiovascular. But for many patients, at least as many, and probably more, the fears relate to dependency, cognitive independence, cognitive vitality, what's happening to their brains. And although we have a plethora of data relating to all the bad things that happen to the heart, the brain has actually been relatively unexplored until more recently. We do know that dialysis-associated brain injury is universal. Everyone gets it. It's progressive. It causes white matter injury, and it's associated with how unstable the blood pressure is during dialysis. It's also made worse by the fact that these brains can't protect themselves. These are data where we take a subject, we measure the flow of blood in their brain with Doppler, and then we put a mask on them where we can manipulate the level of carbon dioxide within them. And that acts as a vasodilator, and the change in blood flow to the change in CO2 gives us a measure of autoregulatory reserve. So here's a normal person. Oxygen stays the same, carbon dioxide gets wedged up, and quite normally, they increase brain blood flow. This is a dialysis patient. Absolutely nothing happens when you change the CO2. So you have a completely energic circulation. And now perfusion has become pressure dependent. And what happens when we dialyze people? We drop their blood pressure. So I spoke about cognitive function. And cognitive function is very slippery. It's quite easy to demonstrate statistically significant differences. It's quite difficult to determine how much cognitive function loss is actually functionally important to patients. So we've relied largely on a, a system called the, the Cambridge Brain Science Score. And this is a series of uh, brain training games that are done visually. It tests all of the domains of cognition. And the advantage is every time the patient does it, they get different games to play. But, the, but the, the data extracted is the same. There's 1 million patients in a normative database, and it's independent of education, race, and language. So it allows us to take individuals and compare them 20 to 1, 50 to 1, 100 to 1 of people like them and define their cognitive performance against where they should be and represent it as a Z score, how many standard deviations away from where they should be. Now, these data from a study that we did, not in dialysis patients, but in people who were on ICU. These were people who had to have very severe critical illness, at least three inotropes, ventilated for at least a week. Most of these patients were survivors of cardiac arrests. And I don't think anybody would argue that these people, when they stagger off ICU, have significant, important cognitive deficits. So each one of these circles is an individual patient. Each one of the columns is another domain. And the dotted line is where they should be. And the circles are where they are. So all of these patients demonstrating severe cognitive impairment. 
This is exactly the same methods applied to hemodialysis patients within six months of starting dialysis. It doesn't look very different. So I would use that to benchmark the severity of what our patients are dealing with. Now, is it the dialysis that hurts brains? When we dialyze, the argument is that do we cause, in the same way cardiac stunning, do we get brain stunning? Do we induce ischemia? And that ischemia then affects the energy-dependent mechanisms that your neurons use to maintain cellular integrity. If they lose those, either from ischemia or from oncotic stress, you start to get what's called cytotoxic edema. And this is exactly what happens in stroke or traumatic brain injury. And this is the precursor to leukoreosis, white matter rarefaction, white matter injury. It so happens that cytotoxic edema has an absolutely unique MRI signature if you use the right kind of stunning. So in this study, we took uh, 17 patients we built a hemodialysis unit inside uh, an MRI scanner, and we dialyzed people while in real time imaging their brains using a variety of different methods. In this case, this is measuring blood flow. Um, red is lots of blood, blue is not much blood. These images are this individual's brain at rest. This is after three hours of dialysis. This looks about the same as if you're having a watershed infarct. This image here shows new areas of cytotoxic edema that have developed from the beginning of dialysis to the end. So this is imaging exactly what I just showed you in the previous schematic. And indeed, when you use various measures of cognitive function, the degree of change in this brain visually is proportional to how bad the cognitive function is. So, Focusing on things patients think are important and sure as hell, dependency, cognitive vitality is important. Third element we'll talk about is discovery because it is better to figure things out than make stuff up, which unfortunately is what we often do or worse still, try to extrapolate fact from epidemiology. The example I want to show you for this is the idea that actually there are other uremic toxins. And the principal uremic toxin that we've not been very good at considering is actually sodium itself. Teleologically, for us to climb out of the sea, we needed a way to handle the salt that we ingested without having to get rid of it in urine all the time because we needed to conserve water. So there was an evolutionary imperative to develop a way to do that. We developed a way where we we're able to stack sodium away in a number of tissues and store it there without water. We could put it in the bone, intracellularly within muscle, and within the interstitium in a number of areas, principally in the skin. The problem is when we store in those areas, it's not biologically inert. There are a whole series of negative biological consequences. In the skin, for instance, what happens is that high salt bound to protein glycans <coughs> draws in and activates immunocompetent cells promotes inflammation and promotes the production, the release of a whole variety of different growth factors and other negative components that are able to affect blood pressure, cardiovascular remodeling. They then get absorbed by the lymphatics and distributed around the, uh, the, the body. Increasingly, we've been able to appreciate this because now we can see where it is. We can take a conventional MRI scanner, we can build a different coil, we can retune the radio on the scanner to instead of listening from the signal from protons in water, they can listen to the signal from sodium atoms. The challenge is that signal is one two thousandth as strong. So it's much more difficult to do, but it is possible. What you have here is a series of legs. This is cut through a thigh. The circles are vials containing sodium at known concentration and are used to be able to calibrate the system so we can calculate exact concentrations within the tissue. It's a heat map. The more it glows, the more sodium there is. So we can compare a normal individual to a patient not on dialysis, but with CKD, all the way up to hemo and PD. Particularly here in the skin, you can see intense deposition of sodium. We know that that sodium deposition is an independent determinant of mortality. 
The lowest quartile over a period of time, nobody dies. The highest quartile, only about one in three of the patients are alive at the end of about 18 months time. And again, it happens to everybody, even children. What you have here is an eight-year-old on the left who has normal kidney function, and on the right, an eight-year-old with a GFR of 18 mils a minute. So you don't need to have been alive consuming uh, Taco Bell's 50 years for this to happen to you. And indeed, we can demonstrate differences in sodium depending on whether or not the children have salt-losing nephropathies or not. So how does this all plug in to cardiovascular disease? Well, obviously, sodium is going to drive pressure and volume overload. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. It does happen. I'm just saying it's only part of what's happening. We know in dialysis patients, we get increasingly aberrant ventricular remodeling. And we know that each degree of aberrance is associated with worse outcomes, with the best being normal geometry, the next best being concentric remodeling, then concentric hypertrophy, and then eccentric uh, hypertrophy. When we took a group of patients, we echoed their hearts, but we did the MRI of their skin. The higher their sodium load that they had, the worse the morphology that they had. When we did measures of volume in these patients, end diastolic volumes, et cetera, these were all at the same volume status. So could sodium be directly cardiotoxic? Well, local hypertonicity leads to hypertrophy and fibrosis. And there's loads of proteoglycan within the myocardium. And that same process of recruitment and activation of immunocompetent cells driving fibrosis is fully capable of happening in the heart. You can see it if you do cell culture work. You can see it if you take mice and sodium load them. You can see they develop dilated cardiomyopathy. And the sodium in the heart can be assessed both by imaging and by inorganic chemistry when you take the hearts out. What we haven't known until recently is does it happen in humans? And that's because MRI for sodium is difficult. MRI for sodium in the heart is very, very difficult because the heart is a long way from the coil and the damn thing moves around. So it's taken considerable energy to be able to um, image patients with their myocardial sodium. These are data from a study that we have running now. We've, we've, we've looked at the first seven subjects at the moment. We combine conventional proton cardiac MRI to be able to measure morphology, cardiac function, and then combine that with a sodium MRI of the heart, allowing us to choose a chunk of the heart and quantify the amount of sodium within it. And what we know already is that the dialysis patients have 60% more sodium in their hearts than non-dialysis patients. So there's definitely deposition there. We're now working through to try and understand the consequences of that. Now, this is discovery. This realization opens up a whole range of different therapeutic um, opportunities. There are drugs that can lower sodium. There are approaches that can allow us to remove sodium from the body without removing so much water to dichotomize it. And all of those could now be applied into this evolving understanding. And that brings me to innovation. And it needs to be innovation pointing in the right direction. Just doing new stuff for the sake of it is not necessarily clever. So we can repurpose things we already know might help. In this case, this is looking at the idea of ischemic preconditioning. If you make an organ ischemic, you protect it from further ischemia. If you make an organ distant from the one you're trying to protect, through the power of magical elves and other things we don't understand properly, that protection is transferred to the organ. That's remote ischemic preconditioning. That's been used looking at protecting from cardiac injury and in, in heart attacks and strokes with considerable success, but not universal. And part of the problem is you have to precondition before the insult. And many of the settings we want to use this in, we don't know when the insult's going to happen. Dialysis is different. We know to the minute when the insult's going to happen. And that gives us that window of opportunity to precondition. This is data from a, an early RCT. We did a, a subsequent one sub after this. The patients received a RPC intervention, which was a blood pressure cuff on the leg, blown up to 200 millimeters of mercury and left there for two minutes. 
They received it once. And then they were studied for 28 days. We measured the number of segments that stunned on dialysis as a measure of severity of dialysis-induced ischemic injury. The ones who were not preconditioned, they had a sham procedure, remained the same. The ones who were preconditioned had a significant reduction in this level of injury, and that was maintained for 28 days. This is just looking at endotoxin that leaks from bowel into the blood to look at an, if we could protect another uh, organ. In the ones who had sham treatment, they had very high levels of circulatory endotoxin. In the patients who were treated with RPC, they had half a level of endotoxin circulating their blood, indicative of multi-organ protection. Can we protect other organs? Well, what about those precious brains? Those 17 patients who I showed you were subsequently randomized and studied for a year, receiving either sham or RPC on a monthly basis. This is data showing um, MR spectroscopy where we measure the levels of certain chemicals in the brain. NAA and choline are markers of uh, brain energetics. The ones who got sham got worse over a year. The ones who got treated got better. Here, the blue is showing new white matter injury changes in the untreated, sham treated patients from baseline to a year later. These individuals all suffered progressive significant white matter injury. This is exactly the same kind of scan, but for the patients who received the ischemic preconditioning, almost no evidence of new injury. And indeed, when we looked at measures of cognitive function, the ones who were treated maintained their cognition. The ones who were not got worse. So I'd suggest that there are multi-organs that we could protect. We can look at devices. If ultrafiltration on dialysis is so terrible, why do we not think about continuing ultrafiltration after dialysis? And we're particularly interested in the idea of dealing with residual ultrafiltration. That group of patients who at the moment, their only choices are leave them wet, and they're going to get worse and end up with fluid overload events. Increased ultrafiltration rate, which is going to injure everything worse that I've already shown you, or bring them back for additional treatments, which in Canada is unpleasant and difficult to schedule. In America, you're not unfortunately being reimbursed for it. So strangely enough, people aren't very keen on it. So we're looking at a possibility of a wearable device. This is the Mark I. We've already done human trials. This device is... Uh, horrible to look at uh, and was markedly overcomplicated. The Mark II device is already almost complete, and this is going to be a much simpler 3D printed, almost analog device, where we've already built the, uh, the custom built filters that we'll be including within that. The other area is drugs. We've been very poor at actually harnessing drugs to help dialysis outcomes. This is one drug that we're doing work with at the moment. It's a synthetic angiop angiopoietin-1 mimic and but, uh, activates TI1 and TI2. The result of that is it alters vascular permeability. So it means that for any given degree of hydration, you will develop less edema. So that may be important, for instance, if we think about pulmonary edema. Actually, could we keep people wetter but not suffering from pulmonary edema? But also remember those brains all develop edema. That's the core component of injury. So our first studies are directed at volume status congestion, but critically, could we have a drug intervention that could also help to protect the brains? So five, this is a, this is a cup that one of my colleagues found. I'm a nephrologist. I solve problems you don't know you have in ways you can't understand. We're really good at thinking we're really clever. And actually, I'm not sure we even keep up with the cup half the time. And one of the things we're not very good at is stopping stuff that clearly isn't useful. And I won't show a lot of stuff here. I'm just going to be refer to what your mother told you. Never trust anything that doesn't have a unit. And that's KTOV all over. We know that small solute clearance measured with pre and post bloods is probably deeply unhelpful in managing most of our patients. And yet we still persist in doing it even though there is time and resource that could be very usefully repurposed to doing something more useful instead. Now, I want to talk about monocultures and jungles. 
Monoculture is what I mean by you think you have one problem with one solution, which you test in one linear Cartesian uh, exploratory or cluster randomized fashion. And the problem is monocultures tend not to be very healthy. Jungles is where all of the hybrid vigor is. And unfortunately, our patients are not living the prairies. They're living in the jungle. And that's important because we've got twin challenges to deal with. It would be nice if we could do a brilliant personalized medicine approach where we were able to define the characteristics of each patient and tailor the therapy to them. But the trouble is, in a clinic, I don't know what's going on in any one individual. Intraocular hypotension is a good example. Using tools I'll show you in a little bit, I can characterize at least five different classes of circulatory failure, all of which would respond to a different kind of intervention. But when I'm in a free range clinic, I can't do that. So I need a jungle of multiple interventions, not a single one that's only going to target certain individuals. The other issue is one plus one equals three. If we start to combine interventions, the hope is if we understand the pathophysiology, we actually can start to get a synergistic interaction between them, optimizing and leveraging each other for a better outcome. So an example, cooling the dialysate, being around for an age, increases your cardiovascular tolerability, reduces cardiac stunning, can be uh, individualized so you tolerate it, protects hearts, protects brains, okay? All of those data are completely consistent. They're consistent with the epidemiological data relating to uh, studies such as DOPS, looking at an improvement in outcome in units that rely on cooling to address IDH. Um, we can demonstrate it to say the hearts are protected. And when we look at the brains, here at the top, the red bits are new white matter injury occurring in a year. The brains here are the cooled patients. These are patients new to dialysis, 76 of them randomized to cooling or not. But the cooled ones a year later didn't have any new white matter injury at all. This little red box here, this is the percentage of voxels, the percentage of three-dimensional pixels in each neuroanatomical compartment that were demonstrating the change. It goes like zero to about 30%. That's the ones who were not cooled. These are the cooled patients, zero, 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 zero. We did not need to do any clever statistics on this. Now, as always, you want to try and uh, increase implementation. And implementation is often driven by the randomized controlled trial. So we set about doing a cluster randomized controlled trial. Every patient uh, in Ontario, uh, 17,000 patients, four years, randomized to cooling or not cooling, administered data sets. And the result was a Lancet publication and a completely negative study. And this is where we run into problems with monocultures. I can give you at least half a dozen reasons why this study was negative. And because of the nature of the study and the nature of the way the data is collected, I can't cut the data and analyze it to actually investigate or prove any one of them. But here's, a here's an intervention that certainly can reduce circulatory stress, certainly in a significant proportion of people. What about, though, if we could actually improve how tolerable the tissues were to ischemia? Now we could start combining interventions, reduce the stress, increased tolerability. And we could do that from a variety of ways. And one of them is with intradialactic exercise. Exercise conditions the heart both immediately and has a longer term effect after multiple applications. Initial study that we did in Winnipeg with Clara Bohm, we could demonstrate when we exercised the patients, they had less stunning. It didn't change their blood pressures and it didn't matter how much exercise they did. Any exercise was good. We've now repeated this study with myocardial perfusion measures and have shown that it doesn't change perfusion, but it does cause protection. And this is now part of an exploratory RCT that we're doing with, and Clara's leading, which is about halfway through randomization at the moment in, through seven centers internationally. So we're getting towards the end, you'll be thrilled to hear. How do we measure impact? How do we measure impact that actually matters to patients and we can actually translate it and talk to them about it. 
we could do something mathematical and something relating to biomarkers, or we could just work out how badly does this thing suck and ask people, when I do this to you, does it suck less? So again, specific examples, again, not for everybody, but this is how we approached it. We developed a dynamic patient reported outcome tool. We had six questions that were developed from the literature and interviews with 80 patients and analyzing those interviews. We then developed an app-based system that involved a being loaded onto a tablet or phone for either Apple or Android and prompts patients on a daily basis to just move the sliders between I'm feeling great or it's sucking very, very bad. These data are then downloaded centrally and allows us to then appreciate the area under the curve of what living with dialysis is like. So what you have here is a representative kind of output. The 100 point is everybody feels brilliant. The zero point is you feel absolutely garbage. You can already see that with dialysis, there's considerable point-to-point -point variability. And that's hardly surprising in a therapy, which is by its very nature, episodic. And this is the problem with using conventional instruments that just capture a moment in time. I can almost make it anything I want, depending on when I ask the question. These data are from a study where we used a new kind of dialyzer that we knew had biological effects, but we wanted to see did it make people better. And we could demonstrate that as they transferred from standard dialysis to the new dialyzer, slowly they got better, very indicative of a clearance-based effect. When we stopped it and put them back on it, slowly they got worse. And then when we re-challenged them, slowly they got better again. So we were able to track all of these changes in that way. We're able to then initiate this onto a clinic-based uh, basis. And indeed, another day, another talk, we've even been able to look at it turning into a trigger tool using a machine learned AI algorithm to identify significant changes in individuals from their previous baseline. So it's a complex problem and it needs complex interventions. We have an inadequate precision medicine base really to do anything else. And we're going to need to abandon the intellectual vanity that we know exactly which component of our intervention was the most effective in each individual. If it makes them feel better and live longer, it doesn't really matter. This again is another specific and very extreme representation of that ethos. Um, within my lab, we have a three station hemodialysis unit, which we use as a, uh, a research hub, allowing us to take patients out of their clinic units away from that busy area and able to use time, privacy, dignity to study them very intensively. We have utilized from the beginning of this year that area to take all of those tools I showed you that we apply and apply them to patients who are referred to us by other clinicians as being completely intolerant of dialysis and they haven't been able to make them feel better. Some of these people have been rejected for transplantation. Some of these people are considering withdrawal from dialysis. Some of these people live a long way from us and are facing the idea of being repatriated to the center because they're not well enough to be dialyzed closer to home. We apply all of these tools. We define the anatomy of their defect, and then the patients receive an individualized treatment plan, which we then test and then release them back to the fold. The impact measure before is their dynamic PRO scores, and they're followed ad infinitum after graduation to see how they benefited and is it durable. These are just some data, just objectively. So here, we, for instance, we have the reduction of blood pressure during dialysis right at the beginning of their time on the patient optimization program and after the two weeks of treatment. This is looking at the severity of cardiac stunning. The average is seven out of 12 segments, pretty severe. This is the amount of stunning after they've been optimized. And if we look at their dynamic patient reported outcome, you can see that it's pretty schlonky at the beginning. There's significant improvement and that improvement appears to be robust. Before you ask, these are two patients who got COVID and we were able to actually track that from, from, their, from their quality of life. 
So I apologize to the mixed crowd, but I asked the question, is the fruity language justified? And I include this slide because I think this is completely valid patient voice. This is a patient, one of my patients, who when he's transferred to my care, I went to see and I was examining him and I was looking at his access and this is what I found. He'd started dialysis 18 months before and he came from a rural community outside the city and three of his friends, for instance, school, were also on dialysis and they all traveled on the same bus. Within 18 months, he was the only one of the four that was still alive. He told me, I feel like garbage before dialysis. I feel like garbage during dialysis and I feel like I've got a hangover after dialysis. So he got his wife to put this tattoo on him because he wanted to remind the people treating him how he felt about it every single time they did it. So very extreme response, but I think it gives you some idea about the level of distress that he was going through. So with that, I'll finish. And I can't finish without thanking the amazing people who I'm lucky enough to work with and make some of what I show you possible. Thanks very much indeed for the time you go. Thank you, Chris, for uh, not only in the innovation, but also the reminder that we're really here to, to try and make it better for our patients. And I think together um, with some of the different there, there is a, there are a few questions and so we'll open it up. Um, so um, excellent presentations as Dr. Horgan, um, with respect to PD patients, do they show consistently better cognitive function uh, as compared to matched hemodialysis patients? That's, that's an excellent question. There is observational data that says that they do, but of course there's worries that that's a, a indication bias and it's the better patients who get put on PD. They've tried to adjust for that, um, but, but they're not able to uh, fully. We have done these studies looking at the heart with PD, with both drain, filled drain infiltration, and PD does not cause cardiac stunning. And then those brain studies I showed you where we dialyze people inside the MRI scanner, we are presenting uh, those data at, at ASN next week. And um, I can tell you that the PD patients do not suffer from that acute brain injury during it. What they do get, though, is when we do the MR spectroscopy, they get brain hyperglycemia. Hmm. Now, we know that patients who have uh, Alzheimer's, one of the main mechanisms there is the development and deposition of advanced glycation end products in the brain tissue. And it's entirely possible that PD patients, although doing better than hemo, still get progressive injury. But that's a metabolic driver that's happening. But it is different. Interesting. Um, so a couple of more questions. Um, are there data uh, linking sodium load and restless leg syndrome or pruritus? Um, such good questions are these plants? Yes, there are data and we've, we've published on, on both and they, they do significantly associate with both of those issues. And we've got data in a smaller number of patients using a different dialysis system that is able to depurate sodium more and those patients have had less pruritus and less restless legs so i don't think it's driving all of it but for instance compared to phosphate i think it's a lot more important a niche than phosphate is yeah no i think i think most of us are off the phosphate wagon but um so another question and maybe i'll uh, from whether or not hdf um in any way changes that ischemia effect so so we, we, we did that study. We, we took a group of patients, we published in Jason about six, seven years ago. We took a group of patients and we dialyzed them to exactly the same fluid removal, et cetera, with HDF and with matched cooled hemodialysis. That was, that was important. Their thermal exposure was the same. And we dialyzed them while we did cardiac MRI and we did function, we did myocardial flow, and we did coronary artery flow. And there wasn't a pixel of difference between the two. There is no advantage within that short term at all. So if there are advantages with hemodial filtration going forward, it will need to be in a story cast in the middle molecule clearance part of it. Um, you know, I, I think we're in a difficult area at the moment. I, I was at a talk the other day talking about cluster randomized trials and saying, well, they have their drawbacks, but surely it's better to have some evidence than none. Well, not if you're full of type one and type two error. You know, type two error is you fail to find the effect. And I think that's probably what happened in my temp. 
um, convince as a study is almost like a dog whistle for a type one error. You know, it was it was done by a group of individuals who were united in the shared trauma of their individual RCTs, not showing an effect of a therapy that they were heavily invested in. They then called it uh, pragmatic only because there was very poor data collection. The actual intervention had like 28 steps to try and get people into high flow to allow high exchange volumes. They then managed to lose three times the number of patients that were the difference between mortality between the two groups from one of the groups, and then demonstrated a difference in infection, and that was COVID, that was biologically entirely implausible and had never been reported in any other study of HDF in 30 years. So I think if we rely on serial individual monoculture type um, studies to define what we should do, I think we're going to struggle. I think they're excellent studies to define potentially how to do it and how to operationalize, but they become the final stage. They're not part of discovery. I know, excellent points. Um, there's another question outside of cooling and intradialytic exercise. Are there other things that you conventionally employ um, in the population that we could sort of translate into ours? And then the other question, the corollary is the app that you're using uh, to measure patient outcome um, or to, to sort of have the self-reported, um, is that available for use in other places and spaces? Okay. Uh, the, first, the first question first, but I think um, certainly we've been, we've been using various tools, but if this one seems to um, be responsive to interventions, I think that's the thing that we're all uh, struggling with. Yeah. Sorry, it's two questions. So, on, but we have time. So the first bit, we we have a we have a complete jungle of interventions that we're using in the in the in the pop in the in the optimization program, and they're from things that are very well proven, if you like, like cooling, to things that are less well proven, like replacing carnitine deficiency. You need carnitine to utilize free fatty acids to do myocardial contraction. So patients who've been on dialysis a long time are very carnitine deficient, and that impairs their ability to increase contactility later. So we use carnitine, cooling, exercise, RPC, individualized ultrafiltration rates, a whole plethora of things. And the hope is that from this ongoing program, we will start to be able to define out the highest impact interventions. The other hope is we want to refine the assessment process so it can actually be done less intensively and virtually so we can then weaponize it and use it more broadly. But at the moment, the laboratory for it, the furnace for it is this very high intensity area, which we're probably going to we're probably going to report on probably mid of next year. So, yeah, I can give you the list of things, but I, 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 I'm not clear in my mind yet. There's also a list of things we stopped doing, by the way, which is even more interesting. We've taken every patient of midodrine. We've not given any patient albumin. None of the patients receive extra therapies anymore. There's a whole series of things that we are spending time, energy, and money on that actually you can free up. So this isn't just a question of this is more intense treatment. Isn't this lovely? It's going to cost more. Actually, I suspect when we do the cost analysis, it's going to be the opposite. Yeah, a great point. Oh, and, and the app. So, so, yeah. so the app is available on uh, on the Android store and on the um, on the Apple store. At the moment, it's only it only works in collaboration with us because it dumps into our service, and we have to register your patients in a separate clinic. So we have done remote working in different countries and different continents with it. So it is possible, but, and you can download it today, but you can't download it and use it, unfortunately, with, yes. with, without us at the moment. We're working on that. That's okay. Um, it's, it's still interesting. You know, I'm also struck, um, so I'm just waiting to see if there's other questions. Like, you know, as, as all of us know, people are individuals and there's heterogeneity in this responsiveness. And whilst you've shown you know, incredibly convincingly and with amazing technology, you know, this persistence, I mean, there, there, there are people that we all know who are on dialysis for 18 years yeah. or, or 30 years. Uh, you and I think all of us know uh, 
this one particular patient who uh, is on a number of the patient councils and stuff who uh, first started dialysis when he was 18 and is currently 53 years old. And it's remarkable how people, some people do okay. And is there something different? Like, have we looked at their their the deep genotyping phenotyping of these individuals who are despite all of this um damage yeah, it's, it's such a tempting approach isn't it you know to, to take the extreme wild types and see what we can learn yeah. from them um we, we actually looked at about 11 patients who we managed to identify when i was in the uk uh these were 11 people we kind of considered non-carbon based life forms because <laughs> they were just functioning on a completely different biology we didn't genetically look at them but when we looked at them physiologically the main thing they did was they retained the ability to auto-regulate so even though they were walking around with systolics of 75 somehow they were still able to auto-regulate and protect those circulations now how they were doing that i don't know and how i can inoculate that understanding to help others i don't know and at the moment it just sort of sits as a uh, as a marker of how important that the ability to tolerate that unnatural act of dialysis is in terms of, of what's going to happen to our patients. But I, I, we, we all have them, don't we? And, and they are absolutely fascinating. We had a guy in, in, in Derby who at the end of every dialysis session was unconscious. He didn't move and he was actually um, declared dead three times by various residents when they came on. Uh, and they'd come and say, oh, uh, Alex, Alex has just died. I said, go back in 20 minutes. It'll be fine. And you go back and you'd be having a cup of tea. So, yeah, so we, we all have them. But I, I there's something very special about them, but hard to replicate. Yeah. So two uh, questions. Um, just a reminder of how you're doing this ischemic preconditioning in the hemo patients. And then have you altered your dialysate sodium um, or, how, you know, the, yeah. the low hanging fruit seems to me that we give people sodium and how would we not give them sodium? So um, the ischemic preconditioning, there's all kinds of proprietary methods you can use that are very expensive. We use the dirty and cheap. We use a standard blood pressure cuff. We put it on a thigh. We pump it up to 200 millimeters of mercury. We leave it for two minutes. And then we repeat that three cycles within a 10 minute period, once a month. Sham, we do it, but we pump it up only to 40 millimeters of mercury. So we include the vein, but not the artery. So, and this is done before they start dialysis? Correct. Just while we're putting the needles in, et cetera. And, and once a month. And we haven't had anybody who won't tolerate it. And of course, it's a very easy intervention to get patients to accept because they say, well, what does it involve? And you say, well, have you ever had your blood pressure taken? Yes. It's just going to be just like that, but it's going to be for two minutes. So so people have a pretty good sense of that. And we haven't had any ischemia or you know any other events associated with it. Um, <laughs> What was the other part of it? Um, uh, so dialysate sodium. Yeah. So I am absolutely convinced that dialysate sodium needs to be individualized. My challenge is I have absolutely no idea what to individualize it to. Attempts to individualize it to serum sodium are just crazy talk. The sodium moves from the blood determined on the sodium concentration in plasma water. That's the compartment that it comes from. That is not what we measure in the lab. So you may have a sodium 135. Your plasma water sodium may be 125. You may dialyze against 132 millimole per liter. You are still going to sodium load that patient. Yeah. And the problem is that, that, that proportion of how much is the plasma water varies. And it's determined by temperature, by pH, and by albumin, and by hemoglobin concentration, all of which were changing during dialysis mm -hmm. so we're actually thinking that the dialysis period is probably not the time to tackle the sodium because we need the sodium to maintain the circulation so we're looking increasingly at other ways interdialactically for us to remove sodium without us taking out large volumes of of, of water to again dichotomize those, those two issues we did a small rct where we randomized people for a year between 137 and 140 and with mri we could show the 137 patients had significantly less tissue sodium but how low could we go how how far could we push that and i think that's that that becomes competing risk 
Yeah, no, it's the million dollar question. Literally, it's been going on since I was a resident. But yeah. um, which is why we might just have to sidestep it and do it a d d different way. Yeah, or maybe we shouldn't be using like think about dialysis in with a completely different composition. Um, much as people are thinking about um, Dr. Percal has a question, I believe. We'll unmute you, Dave. Dr. Sorry, Percal? I just inadvertently raised my hand. No question. I see. No question. Um, okay, so there's another question. Um, oh, so if we are doing blood pressure at the start and doing us, how does preconditioning different? I think it's just that it's the millimeters of mercury that you pump up the thing to that's so different. You actually have to occlude the, the blood pressure. pressure. Keep it occluded for a little while. And then another could question. do it on an arm, but we do it on a leg because obviously we're, we're a bit fussy about arms. Yeah, a bit fussy. Um, and then the question when you look at three times a week, or home or nocturnal, are there gradations of this ischemic damage by virtue of the different modalities or are they the same? So, so we've done those studies too and, 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 and this kind of thing I had to leave out on the talk to try and change the structure to it. We, we compared people who were on three times a week in center, short daily in center, short daily at home and nocturnal. And we looked at cardiac stunning as the primary endpoint and the patients at home all had less cardiac stunning and the nocturnal were better than the short daily. When we looked at the in-center short dailies, they weren't any better than the thrice weekly, but they were all reactive. They had all been transferred to daily because of their huge gains. Yeah. And when we looked at their ultrafiltration rates, they were identical to the thrice weekly. So there's nothing magical about daily dialysis if you don't use it to unlock less circulatory stress. Mm -hmm. But it is a very tempting uh, mechanism. I mean, for instance, just sodium removal, that's time dependent. So you can depurate sodium much more effectively on a nocturnal dialysis than you can by any kind of a short treatment. But yeah, it, it is. And I don't go on about it just because, you know, it's, it, it's very hard to make it for the masses. And I'd love us to come up with solutions that aren't clever maps, but are actually things we can industrialize because it's an industrialized problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I want, I think it's, a, it's a, um, appropriate. Our last comment is from one of our patient partners who is on and said it was an excellent talk, hard for a patient to hear because it's a bit scary, but really good to see the commitment to improvement. Um, uh, I, I really value those comments and and and, it, and I do hesitate because it, it is scary but you know what I tell all my patients in that pre-dialysis clinic exactly the same thing and I'm criticized by my colleagues because they say some people will choose not to have dialysis because you've scared them off you sign informed consent I can't take you to the OR without telling you what might happen in the operation and I am particularly worried that when we don't tell people some of the bad things that happen when they happen and people are not stupid, they say, why did they lie to me about this? And what are they lying to me about now? And I think we fundamentally poison our therapeutic relationship at day one because of a lack of honesty. We have to explain to people and then I have to tell them, this is what we're going to do to try and make it better for you. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's, you know, an excellent note to end on. I think all of us are committed to trying to make it better. And I think, you know, stuff gets in the way and life gets busy and the unit is busy. But I think that um, as always, um, you've given us a uh, pause for thought, um, or thought for pause. Well, <laughs> I probably got that backwards. <laughs> you know what I meant? Um, but I think it's also great to see the innovation and using of tools and really, you um, increasing the sophistication of the questions we ask and the way that we get answers. And so I thank you and the whole team for the innovation and for sharing um, your thoughts with us. So with that, we are exactly on time and, and very much appreciate it. We'll look forward to hearing some of these talks at the ASN as well. Thanks so much. Thanks for so time. much, Chris. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Perfect.